Sim is the man behind Sydney band Seams. Their latest EP, 3.1, is out now. Sim, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Matt. You're really, really welcome. Now, last time we chatted, <laughs> so you're the first <laughs> double uh, double interview, and it's pretty close, actually. We timed it well. But, um, yeah, so you released uh, an EP um, uh, just over a week ago, and um, uh, you're, yeah. you announced a tour. So we'll get to all that. But first off, the, cool. the, the last thing we were talking about, um, sort of the genesis of our last chat, was Progfest. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to see you guys at Sydney. I went to the Melbourne show. Talk a little bit about um, oh, nice. your, your set at Sydney and then just the Progfest in general. Yeah, oh, I mean, Progfest is always a blast. Like, I think the beauty of that type of festival, I think more the beauty of the audience as well, is that they're kind of up for everything and anything that's a bit different. So... Um, the, the Sydney show had a great mix of like, obviously you've got, I guess, like, uh, I guess we could call them the standard prog bands like circles and monuments and guys like that who really own that sound. And then, um, and there's a whole bunch of like the awkward cousins, I call them. So there's, there was us, there was snuff, there were Hashashin, Um, and the crowd loved everything and anything that was kind of fun for the day. So w- we did really well. I was super, super happy with how it all turned out and how our set went. And uh, we had um, Alex from Meniscus filling in on drums whilst um, Chris was away uh, touring with Pliny across the United States. Um, and it was so good to have him on board. Like, obviously, I play with him in a few other bands. So um, just having his energy on there, totally different dynamic, even though he's kind of playing the exact same thing. Um, and it was just nice to see that uh, that warmth and that uh, acceptance. <laughs> I don't know. I think, I think we're a band that's used to kind of polarizing the room. So it's kind of nice to see... I guess the whole room really, really received our stuff really well. Mm, that's really good to hear. Yeah, it was a great day down in Melbourne as well. Um, so you got the upcoming tour, Japan and Australia, or you know, Japan and the East Coast yeah. of Australia. Um, so you released the new EP. Talk a little bit about how how you're going to approach this tour. Uh, in terms of bringing the EP to life? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, we've um, we've kind of had some complications, which I think have worked out in our favour in the long run. I, I try to I try to be optimistic and positive with everything that happens. Uh, but our our trumpet player last year had fractured his spine, and um, and uh, we thought he was on the path to recovery. And even at uh, our progress set, he was kind of like, "Oh, I think I need to go back and see my doctor again." Um, the poor guy's been banned from flying, which was a, a bit of a, a suck considering his situation first of all and then um and then the fact that you know he was there for our first japan tour so he was so looking forward to the second one with um because we've got quite a few shows lined up and some great shows and uh, and he was just so gutted so so my my thinking was rather than trying to replace him and find someone who was equally as amazing on trumpet and synth because he plays both and that's a pretty random skill set to have both um because the EP is a bit more strings focused as opposed to, I guess, like synth and, and brass focused. Uh, what we've done is we've um, recruited Cat Hunter. So Cat um, is the singer and multi instrumentalist behind the band Lack the Low, so a Melbourne artist. Uh, she's incredible. She's been a friend of ours for years now. And um, it kind of just made sense to go, hey, do you want to jump on board and come play in Japan with us? He, you have to learn all the songs by May. Um, they're not easy, sorry. Um, but again, she's the type of person that jumped up at the opportunity and was so thrilled with, uh, with being a part of it. So that's cool. And, um, and, uh, and then the other one was Sorsha, our guitarist. She's uh, actually in a giant theater production, um, that's on during May. So uh, we've had to replace her as well, but we've got our original guitarist Sam back on, 
which is also exciting because uh, he had to drop off before the last Japan tour, so he actually missed it. So it was a nice full circle of him kind of getting the second chance to go, oh my God, I could come and play Japan, finally. Um, so yeah, we're, we're super excited. And I think just having to rearrange everything again for violin and, and, uh, and retraining the whole guitarist on completely new songs. And I'm looking forward to it because there's nothing more fun than uh, trying to challenge yourself. Mm, definitely, definitely. I'm looking forward to you guys, uh, seeing you guys when you come down, uh, south. So that's really exciting. It's awesome. Come here. Um, let, let's go to the music. So this is something we actually went we so we went into a lot of depth about uh, three last time, and so I don't want to yeah. necessarily um, you know <laughs> try and replicate a two-hour podcast about the EP, but, <laughs> but like I really am kind of in awe of your ability to put to words your kind of thinking about those songs, and I kind of wanted to get a similar kind of thoughts from you about this album so uh, I've got, uh, let's start off with this uh, I, don't, I don't think we necessarily covered it um, although I, I did listen but who knows I may have missed it <laughs> <laughs> so you, you you worked on three and at some stage you're like I'm not quite done with this this kind of idea I want to do something subsidiary to it at what, at what stage did you want to realize you wanted to do 3.1 this kind of idea that that would make an ep yeah it was um it was so when i had done three um and the closer on three is imperfect black and i always knew that absolute black was going to be its sequel but i didn't know in what form even to the point where when we did our merch run we released the absolute black t-shirt as kind of like the uh i guess the final say of that story but I knew I still wanted to kind of continue this journey through the whole luminance phase because I think that's something that just really interests me. Um, obviously, color all relates to itself and can create anything, but light affects it just as much. Uh, and that was something that was really it just kind of kept poking through. And then when I thought, and I didn't want to go black, gray, white because then again we're kind of basing luminance in color, and that defeated the whole purpose. Um, but then. I kind of retraced the steps of what the journey was and Imperfect Black was all kind of about falling into the unknown and not being uh, necessarily afraid or scared of the unknown in, you know, into the, the, the Imperfect Black void that you fall into. It's more about kind of just accepting the moment of where you are and being with it, whether it's for better or for worse. You know, you've got to acknowledge the time of, of where you are and, and what you're doing. So then it kind of made sense to kind of complete that journey. We come out on the other end through, I guess, you know, if you think of like the cliche TV movie, walk towards the light type of thing, that was kind of the thing that resonated for me in that story. But then we've got to start with that impending doom of absolute black. Uh, and that was kind of where it started. Absolute black. I wrote that song in a, in a day and a half. Like I knew exactly what I wanted with that and where, it, where it was supposed to go. And kind of the same with clarity. That was, I, that was kind of written over, probably two days, even though it's a more simple song, I guess. Um, and Translucence was always the one that was, uh, it was stuck. I could never make it work. Um, and I tried for a couple of months and I just wrote all these other cool songs and I just continued to delete it because it just didn't really convey that story of going from darkness, absolute darkness to absolute light. Um, until one day, literally I was in Melbourne uh, in an Airbnb with my fiance lying on my lap super romantic, all that crap. Um, and then, uh, and I'd actually gotten a new guitar that day as well, which was really awesome. Um, and, uh, and then it came to me there kind of playing that acoustically in this weird little Japanese apartment in the middle of Richmond. And, uh, and then straight away that was, the, I quickly recorded my voice memos then tried to film myself recording it. And then of course I already forgotten it by that time. Um, but then when I got back to Sydney, it all came together really well. Mm, mm, mm. Um, all right, so so we've got that sort of basis. I, I want to go through each of those songs and get your sort of thought about how you kind of link the um, sort of concept to your approach to that, that particular song, uh, musically. Yeah. So, um, so Absolute Black, so if you, if you want to get technical with this, so Absolute Black and Imperfect Black are kind of like... Uh, I wouldn't say yin and yang, but kind of like two evil twins. That's kind of how I see them. And one's more evil. One's a bit confused, but the other one's just pure evil. Um, and 
the the way Absolute Black kind of came to form was using the exact same chord structure as Imperfect Black, but completely changing the absolute tone and dynamic of it. So at the at the core of it, it's still oh, fuck I don't even remember the chords now because I play bass, not guitar. Um, <laughs> but it's it's like A A minor C D whatever whatever that is. It's the exact same chord structure, not in seven, it's in four this time. Um, and then uh. And it was all about taking that motif, because that was also the motif that came to be formed in three, taking it from its imperfect black state and then just being really, I guess, absolute. And then how do you transform, how do you convey absolute in um, in music? Well, you throw everything you can at it and you'd be really, really definite with the notes that you try to put in the melodies, because absolute is really, I guess, there's no sense of, of cloud. There's no sense of, mystery or what it could be or what it couldn't be it is here it is and here is exactly what it is you will get it face value so that's kind of how that song came to be really really quickly um and the synth bass line and stuff that all kind of falls apart in the middle and comes back in the disco beat kind of the same thing again you know exactly where it's going you know exactly what it's doing and it still kind of feels a bit oppressive uh translucence was was that that moment of going okay so how do we create a passage, right? You really have to create a passage to get from one point to the other. That's the whole, that is the whole reason that that song exists. So you need to create the two ends. So, um, so absolute black finishes on a G major seven. So it's quite a pretty chord and then taking the minor third of that and going in, uh, going into, oh no, sorry, it's the major third, but then turning that into a minor. So again, being a bit music nerd on that. Um, and then, uh, and then kind of giving it that three, four swing, right? So it's all about that, that waltz. That's kind of like that constant sidestep that you go through where you're, you're constantly sidestepping as you try to walk through and navigate this piece. And translucence, when you look at the structure, it is theme A and theme B. Like there is, there is kind of the middle ground always washes and there's always like that little resolve in that halftime that kind of keeps peeking through. But when you get straight to the bare bones of it, it's here's the start of that journey and here's where you end up. And then that whole 11 four section at the end, um, in, uh, in, was it? It's in G minor, I think. Um, again, it's just like just to really make people feel like they've actually found where they're supposed to be getting to. Um, and then when you get to clarity right at the end, that, that song is just straight up rock and roll. Oh, I was going to say four, four, it's in seven. Um, and then the end is, 24 if you like fun time signatures um but again clarity was all about okay so if you think about clarity in terms of what it what it means it's 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 kind of similar to absolute but absolute is is about a definition and clarity is about open perception so to create open perception you've got to kind of create something that is really easy to digest very quickly and try not to stray from it uh and then so Clarity just goes through this one seven four motif, and then eventually it, it breaks to have a breath, and then it just continues on until the big twenty four section. And then that whole big end section is all about everyone just coming in, everybody solos on it. There's a cello solo, there's two violin solos, there's a trumpet solo, there's a guitar solo, there's a bass solo. Chris is basically a drum solo in himself anyway, um, and that all happens simultaneously at the end because it was just more about kind of everyone having their voice as they've, I guess, perceived to, to find the light um, until it, it kind of dies off and you've got that end 24 motif and you're like, oh, cool, that's what it is. And ideally, it's supposed to leave a little smile on your face after that whole journey. It did for me when I wrote it, so um, hopefully it does for other people as well. Mm, mm. What was it about kind of a, a more sort of straightforward, and obviously straightforward probably isn't the word when it comes to seams, but like a more straightforward, rocky approach? What was, what was that that sort of spoke to you about clarity? Uh, it, was, it was, again, kind of like looking at the idea of simplicity with that song. Um, and that song, the, the chord structure I initially thought of when I was backstage with um, Alex O'Toole at a no gig, so no is just a two piece with myself and Alex Romiscus. And we were just fucking around in the middle of Penrith for a random gig. And I just, I just kind of had that weird seven four riff that just stuck with me the entire time. And, um, and that's the only band that I actually play guitar in on stage as opposed to bass. 
So it felt kind of naturally fitting that the uh, the moment of clarity is just going to be this really simple guitar chord. Uh, I think if you think back to like, you know, if anyone's ever learned guitar in their early teens or like their, their childhood, you know, you learn really basic open chord stuff. And even this, this, this is not an open chord basic thing, but it is, it is in my books. <laughs> I guess, as you said, you know, seems only goes so simple. Um, but it, yeah, it's just, it's just a chord basher. How do you, how do you be clear with, Hey, here's a guitar song, just bash a chord. And that's kind of it. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. So last time we kind of covered aspects of your writing like that, that general sort of approach of um, having a concept and then kind of figuring out how that applies to music, um, playing on your non-preferred, non-preferred instrument. I want to kind of dive a little bit deeper into that. So you mentioned that translucence was kind of a struggle for you, that you kept trying to get something that worked and it just wasn't clicking. Like, talk a little bit about that sort of trying to make a piece, progress a piece forward. Like, how do you kind of go about that? Yeah, so it was more about... Um, so for me, the songs that I'd written that didn't work, um, they kind of spoke in two halves, and you could you could really define the two halves. You know, there was... Like obviously the, the the whole journey thing that I explained is, is it really is about from getting from point A to point B, but the most of the songs that I'd written to try and be that message were defined as uh, I guess section A and section B, but as two separate blocks, and you never really got the join. And when you kind of listen back to to whatever it was, you could almost hear the song A stop and song B start, and it did feel like two separate songs glued together. So, so translucence, and I think I think part of my uh, thing was was that I was always starting the song heavy, um, because Absolute Black was a heavy song. So I'd always try and start it heavy, and then to kind of get to clarity, which I I kind of already had that down ready to go. Clarity already starts with energy. It's not heavy, but it starts with energy. So when you go from starting heavy to starting with energy, it's still kind of one dynamic. So, so when I started thinking of the concept for translucence, I knew I definitely wanted the three, four swing because I definitely needed that meander, like that definite, that definite, I don't know really where I'm going, almost like a drunken stumble. And, uh, I knew that the, um, uh, I knew it needed to go somewhere big, like almost to a post rock world, you know? Um, cause we're, we're a fan of every genre, apparently <laughs> in our band, when you listen back, um, and the way that I found that would work was that like, kind of like that drunken stumble, you, there's always, you know, if, if you picture like the cliche, someone, you know, stumbling down the street, they always kind of always have a few extra steps and then fall to the side of the road. And then they, they continue their meander for about 10, 20 more steps and then have a whoa, 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 and then kind of stray again. So that stray was actually kind of what, what gave me the, the idea to keep, alluding to somewhere else and then pulling it back and then allude to somewhere else and then pull it back and then allude to somewhere else. And then eventually you've had your vomit and then you can, you know exactly where you're going and where you're supposed to be going, you know? So, uh, so that's where that big 11, four section came from. And, um, and when I'd written it, I'd written both parts separately, but in the same sitting, not realizing they'd be part of the same song. Um, and then when I, when I got back to Sydney a few days later, um, and when I listened back to it to kind of like re-record, start piecing it together to start assembling what would be the song, I just, all I did was record them in the same session and then went, oh, actually, if I swap B with A and A with B, that's the song. And it was. So that was a nice little uh, happy accent that I fell on right at the end. Both parts were there. It just kind of needed to be uh, seen in the right way. Otherwise, I probably would have hit the delete key on it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't be too hasty. <laughs> I, I'm very, I'm very quick with the delete key. I'm very quick with moving on. Mm-hmm. Um, just at a more simple level, like you're sitting down at a keyboard, and you're like, "Yeah, all right, it's songwriting time." Like, what, what's going on in your brain? Like, what, what's what's happening up there? 
So for me, the, the, there's kind of two things. And the first thing I think which is quite important to the process is have everything set up ready to go immediately because you never know when it will actually work, you know? And um, and I think the important thing as well is that when you said when you spend time setting up something, it changes your mentality and your mindset of where you're going to be from an engineering point to a creative writing point. So it's, it's more about being aware of the mental state that you'll be putting yourself in as opposed to what you should be doing. Um, and then so when I go and sit down at the keyboard, um, I'll kind of just hit record straight away and let it go. And it will be... I'll, what I'll normally do is try and find dumb chords. Um, chords that, you know, they, the voicings are nice. I don't know what it is because I'm not that great a keyboard player. You know, ask me to play a major seven and I kind of have to count it out. But it's all about trying to find a voice that sounds like it wants to say something. Um, I still always go in with the uh, an idea of a concept. So for me, that's important because I'm I'm really big on concept albums and you can't really write a concept album without a concept or kind of pre-planning it. Um, so there's always, there's always an idea of where I want to take it or why I want to take it somewhere. Um, but having said that, sometimes the song that I've written ends up being a different concept by the end of it because of just how it's shaped. Um, the other thing I find that I do is I will not do it in, in breaks. I'll kind of do a long marathon run. So staying up till like three, four in the morning and just kind of just power through and just, just get it down. And then when it's done, it's done. And then if I listen back to the next day, if I, if I remember it the next day, I keep it. If I don't remember anything about it, I delete it straight away. Um, and I'm ruthless with that, with that just because I think for me, it makes me a better songwriter because it forces me to create a memorable hook or a, a memorable melody or an idea or like, I guess like it makes, it makes me like evoke some kind of emotion, whether it's just disappointment or happiness or just, you know, just pure angst. Like I definitely need to feel something out of it. So coming back and listening to that after a few days, or sorry, trying to see if you actually remember it before you listen back to it, I think is one of the most important things Uh, for me. It is definitely. And uh, yeah, just power through. I'll always write everything in MIDI to begin with. Um, normally because by the time I've written a guitar riff or a bass riff and then I've come back, it's it's so far beyond what it was and I can't remember what I wrote or how I played it. Um, and that's, that's a very real problem that I deal with a lot of time. So I write everything on the keyboard. So I write bass parts on the keyboard, guitar parts on the keyboard, keyboard parts on the keyboard or strings drums i'll either sit on the v drums or like try and play it out with the pads um and then that way it's all charted and then i can kind of rearrange things as i see fit rather than having to try and re-record things and pick up the guitar again and go re-record a riff or pick up the bass again and go re-record a riff um i think being trying to be a good keyboard player honestly makes a big difference Mm, 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 mm. um you released a music video for translucence kind of I don't know, even more sort of putting forward the idea of combining sort of various art forms and their interrelationships. Talk a little bit about that music video. Yeah, so um, so I met Angela. So Angela is the choreographer and the, uh, the woman that's in the video, the actual performer. Um, I met her on a shoot about four years ago now. So uh, my day job, I work in TV and I make TV commercials and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and she was one of the talent in the, in the, um, the ad that I was directing. And she was just a cool chick. We became friends, like nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, she was a ballet dancer in a in a commercial for I can't remember who it was now. Something to do with bread. Um, and then, uh, and yeah, we just became Facebook friends. Uh, and then one day she pops up on Facebook with a, "Hey, come and check out my new performance piece. I've got a dance company. Uh, we're doing a debut." And I went just because I do love performance art just in general. Took my sister. She's a dancer. Um, and uh, and I fell in love with it. I thought it was one of the most original things I'd seen in a while. Um, the costuming was great. The lighting was incredible. The soundtrack was beautifully amazing. Um, but I think the thing that I took away with most was I just absolutely loved her choreography style, and I thought it was so intriguing. Um, and then a couple of years later, I bumped into her at Procfest 2018, weirdly enough, um, where uh, where Seams had played as well. 
And uh, and she she spotted me in the crowd and was like, Sam, what are you doing here? I'm like, oh, uh, I literally just played a set. What are you doing here? She's like, I like this music. I'm like, cool. We should talk about this more in, in detail. Um, and the song concept idea in terms of the video, I kind of had when um, three was coming to fruition and I really thought it would be a cool clip for Magenta. Um, but just because of time and, and you know, my dog ate my homework excuses, I, it just didn't happen. Um, and then it all kind of aligned for me when I'd seen her in real life again. And then uh, then eventually when it started getting around to recording this album, then we recorded it, I listened back to the dummy tracks and by far Translucent for me was like, oh my God, I fucking love this song. This is cool. And then just had that light bulb moment of, oh my God, this is totally the clip that Angela should be performing in. And uh, and then we booked, obviously we needed somewhere really cool to do it as well. Uh, so we shot it in the Rose Seidler house. So, Rose Se- so I don't know if you know Harry Seidler, um, incredible architect and designer. Um, he's done a lot of world-renowned stuff all over the place. Um, and then uh, he designed and built a house for his mother, so it's, which is now a museum in, uh, in the middle of Solara in, um, in Sydney. So I've wanted to shoot there for years. It's such a beautiful house, and I thought it was the perfect location to complement um, her choreography. And it uh, cost me an arm and a leg, but holy crap, was it worth it. I'm super proud with the result. And that was also um, Angela's complete interpretation of the song as well. Like I didn't really guide her on it. Again, I just kind of explained the concept to her, and uh, she did it more than the justice that I thought it could ever be done. Like I thought it took it to a new level, if anything.
Mm, mm, definitely, definitely. Um, in terms of your interest in art, we, we talked a little bit about colour specifically last time for obvious reasons. Talk a little bit more broadly yeah. about your interest in art, where, where it sort of started and um, kind of what interests you at your current stage. Yeah, so um, I've, I've, you know, I, I used to paint and, and do a lot of that stuff uh, in my teens, and then when music got the better of me, that was kind of that was kind of it. You know, went straight down the music path. Um, but even I think just the work that I do in general, like the the TV work, it's art direction is a really important thing for me. But I've always loved art galleries. I've always kind of find them to be my uh, my favorite place to kind of go and explore. You know, like if I have a a quiet day. Um, I'd, I'd definitely try and go and do it. And for years, that was that was actually how I spent my birthday. I would uh, avoid everyone, take the day off work, and go to an art gallery and uh, just just chill out and have a look at things and sit down and and um, ex- well, I guess try to expand my mind of, of whatever was there at the time. Um, the stuff that I love is all that um, 50s, 60s minimalism, um, abstract. Not cubism, cubism sucks. Um, but uh, uh, stuff that really plays with uh, I guess it's more about the palette than the subject. And I think that's a really important thing because a lot of, especially a lot of older, older art, um, especially like the modernism era is all about the person. It's all about what they mean or where they are or what they're doing or who, what it means to them or whatever, you know? Um, and I couldn't care less about the person, you know? I think it's also, for me, it's like the whole, do you care about the musician or do you care about the music, you know? Um, and for me, I care about the music. And and for me, in that respect, that's kind of where some art I found really limited. Um, and so that's why I love people like, uh, you know, Ros- Mark Rothko, who is really, a really, really um, important artist from the like 50s, 60s, who it's more about color blocking, you know, um, and really textual stuff. My favorite one, though, is... Um, Joseph Albers. So Albers was, his art actually got reduced to the point where it was paper, like as in he would play with blocks of paper um, and not actually paint anything. Some of his stuff was painted, but he was kind of known for the color blocking thing. And uh, and in the 50s, he released a book called The, uh, the Relationship of Color. It's one of my favorite books, actually. Um, and the book, ex- the book kind of gets really scientific on what art actually is and how people perceive it based on the context of what they're seeing. And I think the easiest modern example to explain this is, I don't know if you remember like six years ago, there was the whole, is the dress, is the dress blue and black or is it white and gold? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and what dictated that was the context of how you were seeing it. And most people, obviously when they see it on Facebook, uh, they actually get the white and gold impression because white was the dominant and blue was counted. So, it just kind of tricks your brain to seeing what what you think it's supposed to see. So so his book kind of breaks down the whole color theory and and kind of gives you tests on which color do you think is absolute red and then you think it's the second one and it's like no it's actually the fourth one and here's why. Um, here's the same artwork and here's the same artwork inverted even though you think it looks different because of what it is but the difference is the relationship of the spatial awareness of each color. So I'm exploring, explaining it in a really boring way, but, and there's lots of pretty pictures. So if you're interested, I definitely recommend checking out the book because the, the way it's laid out and the aesthetic is beautiful in itself. Um, but for me, that was, that was really important because if you think back to music, you know, what makes a major chord and a minor chord is one note. It's, it's contextual, right? It's contextual relevance to what you're hearing is how you're defining what you're hearing um whether you think it's happy or whether you think it's sad is because of a one note difference purely with its contextual relevance to the other two notes around it um and this book talks all about that uh and he was also uh, kind of criticized uh both and praised uh in the 50s and the book was banned from harvard and kind of got republished 50 years later type of thing um because it was too uh polarizing and, and kind of freaked out a lot of people, especially when you think about the year of like, uh, like Frida Kahlo and stuff kind of being really big around that time. And you've got this guy coming in demolishing their works because it's not about the people. It's about the color palette. Um, so yeah, so for me, I just really love art direction. I think if you look at the cover arts of all the scenes albums, I think it reflects there really well as well. Mm-hmm. I was actually sort of looking through that and like, Wow, yeah, it, it is actually just a not just a, the last album sort of continues in a certain way on this album. It's sort of been a a thing for you on on seams. Yeah, definitely, definitely. 
Um, so actually, let's let's take that uh, question. Um, this album cover art, um, I think it kind of, in the same way as uh, three captured the idea of the the, uh, the the three colors and imperfect black. This also sort of captures that um, uh, the, the, in a, in another way. Talk a little bit about who made that and uh, the sort of motivation behind that. Yeah, so this one was uh, done by a good friend of mine named James Lieutenant. James and I have been friends for about maybe 15 years. And uh, the whole time I've known him, he's known me for my music and I've known him for his art. Um, and uh, I've, we've both at many points gone, oh, you should totally do art for my album. Oh, man, I'd totally love to do art for your album. And just never got there uh, for... Again, a dog ate my homework reasons, you know, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. And then, uh, and then when this concept came around, I was actually going to get back on the tools and paint something myself. And, uh, and time was escaping me a bit. And then I also kind of went back to the whole, no, 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 the beauty of, of, the, of these albums is that, you know, a different artist brings their interpretation of what it is to the theme. So I was like, cool, I'll hit up James and, uh, and see, and see if he's got time. And, uh, and and what we can submission for whatever the budget is, you know, and uh, and then I just jumped onto his website and then saw this one, the, the one that actually made three point one the cover, um, called uh, found on a uh, found on top of, uh, lit, lit found on top of a paint can, and I was like, oh my god, well he's kind of already just painted the cover art <laughs> retroactively. He's he's done this like maybe seven years ago, but it totally sums up exactly how I saw the album. And I sat on it for a couple of days because I'm like, no, 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 I, maybe I'm just being lazy or maybe I'm just too sold or something I can see as opposed to something I haven't seen yet. You know, if I give him a brief, he'll probably get it even more accurately. Um, but then also for me, it kind of spoke to the testament of how how long he and I have been trying to do this um, this this pairing. And, and I thought it was actually quite fitting that I actually buy one of his existing works um, as a cover art. And when I asked him, it was kind of a no brainer. He was like, Oh my God, fucking yeah, take it. Absolutely. And, and he kind of said the same thing. He's like, are you sure you don't want me to paint you something bespoke? And I was like, no, no, this is more, this is more about, again, the, the together journey on this. And this cover art sums up exactly what it is. Um, and it's, it, it's got the all encompassing absolute black, that giant circle that goes around and you've got the translucence there with the, the, the tape cross going straight through, um, you know, trying to resolve the clarity right right up there. So for me, it was just, it just spoke straight away of, this is the artwork, don't do anything else. Um, and then, uh, and in my living room, I've actually got the first three um, covers like painted on, on board. They're like, uh, I guess like 500 by 500 wide each. And, uh, and I was like, cool, can you, can I actually buy the entire artwork off you? I'd love to buy it. And he goes, oh, I actually don't have it because I sold it to one of our other mutual friends. So he's actually got it in his living room. So it's still nice that it's kind of in a family of, of all of us together. So I'd really love to have it on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, well, that, that's a problem with uh, a seven-year-old piece, I, I guess. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> um. Kind of a really basic question. Why three point one? Like, oh, it's kind of a numerical thing, you know. The um, you know, oh, decimal. Why is not four? No, no, no. Like, so, uh, like, I, I, I think rem I remember we were. You, you mentioned uh, last time that you were working on four, but like, the, obviously, this is yeah. sort of continuation. But why not like three point five or three A or or some other sort of configuration which represents three but different than three. Yeah, so I, I weirdly spent probably more time thinking about that than writing the songs, because <laughs> um, because it was it was quite important to me of like how do I frame this where it doesn't overwrite the previous album, and it still represents a continuation, um, and uh, and three point five implies that there's there's been a few increments incremental changes or that it's gone a bit beyond what it is, um, and three point one is still kind of the idea that it's if you round it down, it's still part of three, um, but it is kind of like its own little section just off. The other name that I thought that would be close was kind of like three continued as the other option, but for me, it broke the style guide because every album's 
you've got self title and then there's two and then there's three and there will be four. Um, so it kind of broke the spell going in that respect. Mm, fair enough, fair enough. Um, I want to finish up like last time with a couple of personal questions about you. Sure. Um, I want to dig a little bit more into you know bass as sort of an instrument. Well, what's kind of I, I, it's probably probably a kind of hard question because you've got a lot of different basses that you use. But what, what's the quality of a good bass when you're playing it? Oh, oh, that's a good question. Um, for me, there's a, there's a few things I think. So, I mean, obviously, uh, size and all of that makes a big difference. And I personally love a 34 inch neck because that's just nothing too small, but nothing too wide. Um, but for me, I love a maple neck because of the, um, I find the attack brighter and I feel like it's, um, I can be faster on it because it's not as a dense wood as rosewood. Um, I love the body weight makes a big difference for me because I really need to feel like it is not there. Like I should be able to move around freely. Um, a great example is I used to have a Fender Jazz years ago that I hated so much because it was so heavy, physically heavy. And it actually wasn't heavy, but it made me feel like I, um, I was kind of weighed down by it. So the two main bases that I use now, so um, the, the Sharp Basics, which is a custom build for me, um, and then the Sandberg California, um, they're both really, really light wood. I think they both weigh like four kilos each, which is super light for a base. Um, so that's really important. Um, for me, and also, and I think this is more specific to my sound, um, but I love bright strings as well. And string texture makes a big difference when you're playing because of A, how you sweat, um, B, how fast you can play on it, and C, I guess the restraint, the resonance that you get as you push and pull on it, um, especially if you're a finger player as opposed to a pick player. Um, so having a really light metal like cobalt, I love, like I love those only ball cobalt strings. Um, and I think for me as well, the other quality would be, um, does it look cool? <laughs> uh, you know, it, you gotta be a bit vain. Sometimes you are playing an instrument on a stage with people watching you. Um, and I think, uh, aesthetic matters in that respect. And I think, you know, I've made it pretty clear on just how important art direction is to me in general, but when an audience is there, they are paying to see a show. So you've got to give them a show and I, you want people to feel like that they've actually spent their money to see something quality. And I think having a quality instrument definitely reflects that. Um, even uh, if, if I play like a really, you know, lame warehouse show with a, with one of my other bands, that's just, you know, not anything special. We'll still put on a show and I'll still take a quality instrument to it because you really notice they don't wear like they don't wear out at all, you know. I've got a I've got a music band stingray that I've had for eighteen years now, I think. Um it was like my first expensive bass that I bought and it still holds up so well. Those things retain their value for a reason. Um and same way even though I just got a new Santa California, it's built so well and you really feel the neck difference from a cheap bass to a to a to an expensive bass. And that neck difference is everything. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, one of the things you said last time was you don't like bass solos. Talk a little bit about that. No, I hate them. I hate them so much. Um, that's why, at least in clarity, it's buried in the song. So often, <laughs> amongst everyone else's solo, um, and even this uh, Tim who mixed it, he did pull up the bass solo. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, give the cello the solo the more time than, than mine, please. Um, yeah, I, I think so. There's a few ways I look at it, but for me, what it comes down to is I write music. I'm not there to stroke my dick in front of people. Um, and music is about the, the teamwork, I guess, and the arrangement. And it's all about how things work in unison to create something bigger. What a solo does is a solo is either, uh, I guess, being selfish in the way that you're trying to give one instrument a voice, um, or it breaks away from the music because a solo is meant to be heard on top of something, right? It's, 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 it's separated audibly from the rest of the music. So the only solos that we have, if you listen back to three, I don't have, is, is kind of like in the noise sections or like the dying solo at the end of Cyan because that is exactly the point of that. It's supposed to be a solo dying. It's supposed to be sad. It's supposed to be really... Um, one voice crying until it kind of dies off. So when it gets to bass solo, I, again, like 
I'm really not there to show off. Like that's not the that's not what Seams is about. Uh, it's also not what I'm about. You know, I kind of no offense to any of the musicians who play really shreddy guitar solo music. Um, but I used to go see the whole Satriani, Steve Vai thing when I was young all the time. And after a while, I couldn't give a shit because it was just, uh, I found, found it really uh, self-indulgent. And uh, and it really wasn't about the music. It was about how many notes you can play faster. And it took me a while to, to learn playing faster with more notes doesn't actually dictate you being as a better musician. It means you have better proficiency, you know? Um, what makes a better musician? Writing, arrangement, scoring, composing, dynamic, texture. You know, it's all about that. And all of those attributes require a bigger, uh, I guess, a symphonic vision of what you're trying to put out as opposed to, hey, check out what I can do. You know? So, yeah. So, the bass solo is from me. I think there's one of me on YouTube, but that was because... Um, oh yeah, that's right. So the start a ton, and that was because someone was tuning or something was wrong with the keyboard, so we needed to fill time. I've made a meme of it somewhere as well. I'll try and dig it up and send it to you, Ben. Sure, sure. Yeah, I can include it in the uh, in the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, so one of the other things you mentioned is there was a battle show, which you sort of found particularly important in sort of shaping your vision of music are, are there any other things that you think are kind of important like moments or events that are important in kind of how you view music how you approach music yeah i think this is kind of i, I don't i wouldn't restrict this to music but i'd kind of say that this was true to all art forms whether it's painting or writing or filmmaking um but it's kind of you will only get better with what you experience, right? So if you experience more of the world, whether you like it or whether you hate it, I think that's going to make you a better person overall in terms of your ability because things that would be unfamiliar become very familiar. And I think if you look at the evolution of music, David Byrne actually covers this in his book, um, How Music Works. But if you look at the um, the kind of the evolution of music, like stuff that's been really uh, like localized and, and isolated, so a lot of like core African music stayed true to its own path for so long because it didn't really have any external influence from anywhere else because it was kind of its own little thing. Um, and same with Aboriginal music, same with um, like a lot of indigenous, just general indigenous music. Um, and then you look at stuff where there's been like a, a bit more of a, like a globalization um, and you can see the influence of other parties kind of come into to where... I, I guess bringing the outside in and going, oh, that's a cool thing. Maybe we should use that. And that's kind of how things get better, right? You, you know, if you look at like a child's painting with paints, you know, you get them the basic kit and it has six colors. It's got red, blue, yellow, green, black, and white. And you go, cool, paint with these six colors. If the kid has a brain, which all kids do, the first thing that they do is mix the colors, right? And they sometimes, yeah, they'll make it into like that shitty brown color that looks disgusting. Sometimes I might make a really nice lavender or whatever, you know. But the beauty is mixture. The beauty is kind of going, I can experiment because with all these tools that keep coming in, I can try new things. And I think it's important to be exposed to new things. So when people, you know, come up to me and they go, oh, I don't listen to hip-hop, I don't listen to, like, I genuinely don't listen to hip-hop, but I'll listen to it if it's on, you know. Um, and, like, I went to an Ensign Pack gig uh, last year. I didn't even know who the fuck that guy was. I didn't care. I was like, my fiance wanted to go. I'm like, yeah, cool. This sounds like fun. You like it? I'm sure I'll, I'll find something in it that I liked it. I loved it. I thought it was cool as hell. Um, because again, it was, it was hip hop done in a different way with flavor. Um, and it's everything that you will be exposed to will give you a different key skill or learning, whether how big or how small. So the most that I can say to anything to that is, constantly explore even if it's going to be something that you think you'll hate do it so then at least you know you're going to hate it and then you go cool i don't like that but now i know that i don't like that so how do i make something that i do like um and that's with all art forms not just music mm, mm, mm. um so under ideal circumstances how do you personally listen to music uh i listen uh whole albums i don't like playlists the only playlists that i have that I use on shuffle is a playlist that I use to practice playing drums to for that reason, because it's supposed to catch me off guard. 
and make me chop and change my style as I go so I can get better. Um, but when I listen to music, I put on a whole album. Um, normally it's something when, before a gig, I'll always listen to the opposite of what I'm going to play. So if it's a themed gig, I'll listen to some cool jazz. If I'm going to go play a session gig, that's like a pop gig. I'll put on Dillinger Escape Plan, you know, like I, I really enjoy having that contrast because then when I get to the gig, I don't feel like I've burnt out that type of um, energy that I have. Uh, if anything, I'm kind of like more keen to kind of play whatever the opposite was that I was exposed to. Uh, normally on, on the way to work, you know, I'll put on a whole album um, and that's normally just going to be something that I love, you know, uh, something new normally. So at the moment I've been spinning Delta Sleeps, uh, Ghost City like crazy. I fucking love that album. Um, and uh, and then at home, I'll still put on kind of like the classics when I work. So even when I'm writing, I'll still uh, have some music on in the background. Uh, Harry, my cat, he likes when I play music as well. Um, and the source of that can be from anywhere, you know, uh, uh, not yesterday, but the day before, because um, Motor Race played a gig on on Saturday in Sydney. Um, I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to play Carry On. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm just going to play a whole bunch of Motor Race today, and then went down a whole rabbit hole of Australian nostalgia from the early 2000s and played uh, something Kate Sikalalia and stuff like that, you know. Um, so uh, yeah, so for me, the source of music kind of comes from anywhere and anything I've been exposed to for that same reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Last question. I think you probably actually you know covered a little bit, but uh, is there anything you've been listening, anything notable you've been listening to since we last talked? Yeah, so definitely. So Ghost Cities, uh, sorry, Delta Sleep's Ghost City album is like my absolute favorite recently. I was a late comer to that album because there was one of those things where I saw so many people talking about it, and I'm like, oh, okay. Well, if everyone's talking about it, I don't want to listen to it right now because they're going to take more of the uh, the thunder of what it is rather than. Uh, what I think it should be. Um, but yeah, fucking love that. It's just a really good math rock album with a lot of pop sensibility and some really cool, weirdly emo lyrics. Uh, don't, 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 don't just my credibility on that. Trust me. Just have a listen to it. It's great. Um, uh, so, uh, I've got a mate in, uh, Brisbane, Benjamin Shannon, his band, uh, Shaman. Um, and it's, it's just a jazz avant-garde jazz duo um with drums and piano really cool stuff um really really well composed and kind of like stretches and then and comes back to nothing and then goes really really out there again um and then uh also the other most recent one is um uh Pineal's, uh brand cuckoo so um Pineal is a french band made up of two other french math rock bands called peel and me um and they've formed to the seven piece and um brand cuckoo is just like it's just a really solid album um two bass players three guitarists two drummers it's fucking huge it's great um yeah but they're, they're my definite top three for my most recent discoveries <laughs> 